Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PDA Town Hall for October 22nd, uh, 2023. And we're getting on to, we're, we're starting to see our uh, fourth anniversary coming over the horizon of doing these four straight years. It's been three and a half years. And uh, we have a really great show today. We're going to have uh, really one of the great uh, progressive heroes um, in recent years and of the last election cycle, who is back at it. And uh, we are uh, going to help lift her into Congress in November. And it's Jamie McLeod Skinner. Um, Jamie McLeod Skinner was, uh, you know, really the only um, uh, Democratic progressive who who beat a prominent conservative Democrat directly in a primary. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were about 10 or so conservative Democrats who were clearly signaling uh, that they were opposed to Build Back Better, including Kurt Schrader in Oregon's 5th District. And um, that's who Jamie went up against in the primaries in 2022 and won. Uh, unfortunately, the district had shifted in the re redrawing of the districts because of the 2020 census to being slightly more Republican leaning. And she barely lost in the general. But we really think in a presidential year, with all the turnout that that's going to produce, in a state that's pretty close, Oregon. So we're going to see a lot of voting. We think we can really get over the top and, and lift a real great progressive champion into Congress. And so we are thrilled to have the first uh, non-incumbent endorsement the PDA has made this year in the federal elections, Jamie McLeod Skinner, uh, join us and we'll be with her soon. Uh, of course, we're going to hear from Donna Smith, from who is the uh, uh, chair of the PDA advisory board, and Mike Fox in a few minutes with PDA to do's. Um, of course, I have some thoughts I'm going to share at the top of the show, and uh, I sort of thought I'd have a slightly um, Tim Carpenter-inspired uh, mini essay that I've been sort of tossing around in my head for today, and that it's going to cite both sports and Bob Dylan. Um, people tell me who, who knew Tim better than I knew Tim that these are two things that I share in common with Tim, uh, passion for baseball, though that's not the sport I'm going to cite. And, uh, and for Bob Dylan lyrics. So uh, in honor of Tim, of course, uh, as, as really everything we do here at PDA is in honor of Tim Carpenter, um, some reflections on what's going on in the world and specifically um, in Israel-Palestine and the United States relationship to that. Um, I don't know how much anybody would hear would know, but the person who's generally pointed to as the greatest English football player, soccer player in history died yesterday, Bobby Charlton. Um, I'm not even sure of the Charlton family's ethnicity, but his brother, Jack Charlton, uh, ended up being the coach of the Irish national team. And in 1994, they made the World Cup, which is, by the way, played in the United States of America. And um, they played their games for their group stage in New York, and they played Italy in a game in which uh, there was anticipated the giant stadium would be packed with Italian Americans and Irish Americans. Well, a lot of passion for the Italian national team among Italian Americans, but by the time that game was played, Giant Stadium was packed with Irish fans more than Italian fans. And uh, though Italy would go on all the way to the finals in that World Cup, which ended up in the Rose Bowl right near where I live. And by the way, the World Cup is coming back to the United States in 2026. And by the way, that year is the 250th anniversary of the United States of America. So we're going to have this huge global spectacle here right around July 4th. Uh, and it'll be the 250th anniversary of the country, something to look forward to in terms of political messaging. But alas, that was one of the greatest upsets in the history, probably the greatest single upset in the history of Ireland, as Ireland defeated Italy in the World Cup game in the first round, um, even though Italy went on to do well in the tournament and Ireland less so. Well, when the players got off the field uh, at the end of the game, they heard about a massacre that occurred in Northern Ireland. Um, and this is 1994, folks. And basically a paramilitary group that was uh, Protestant affiliated, in other words, pro United Kingdom and, and uh, in England, massacred people in a pub, uh, which was known to be an Irish Catholic pub in the countryside, just went in, the place is packed because people like getting together and watching World Cup games together. There's a documentary about it on ESPN's platform you can watch, it's of course incredibly horrifying. But again, armed gunmen went in and slaughtered people unarmed watching the soccer game uh, in uh, rooting for the Irish national team in Northern Ireland. And um, it was absolutely horrific. Obviously, it's a war crime and just a crime of the highest order. And the reason I bring it up is because that was 1994. As you know, the accords were reached in Northern Ireland before the, the end of the century. Nobody saw that coming at that point. And 
and and we have to think about that and think about that as we relate to Israel and Palestine. Um, and by the way, a United States president played a central role in that. There's one place in the world where Bill Clinton remains tremendously popular. It's Ireland because of the role he played uh, in diplomatic negotiations between the two sides and really ending the troubles. But as you can see, as recently as 1994, that kind of thing happened. And tragically, I don't think people were too surprised to see it happening at that point. And obviously, we're in a largely analogous situation, which I don't think anybody really who's been following it at all is surprised by the conflagration. So this is, of course, an un unbelievably horrendous round of that in Israel and Palestine. So um, we are supporting uh, legislation that's been introduced by um, squad members calling for a ceasefire. Um, and first of all, at this hour, I cannot imagine not calling for a ceasefire in Israel-Palestine. I know that there is still a wing of the American sort of national media discourse and the political establishment that doesn't want to hear that word be used. I mean, I, I'm not even going to argue that. And along those lines, I was asked for a quote um, to support the resolution. And I'm going to read what I wrote, and I'm going to try to post it into the chat, the whole thing, so you can read along. Uh, and I submitted this. I knew it was too long to probably get included into the press release um, for, but nonetheless, I did in its entirety submit it. I also got it in late uh, because they contacted us late last Sunday night to sign on to the to the legislation. And, uh, you know, I didn't respond by Monday at, at uh, 6.30 a.m. Pacific time. And so we weren't among the original sponsors, which I feel bad about, but we were on right afterwards. So here's what I wrote. Progressive Democrats of America calls upon all members of Congress to support the ceasefire now resolution. Both morality and common sense demand the ceasefire and de-escalation of hostilities in Israel and Palestine. And let me just stop here for a second. Since I wrote this, there has been, of course, an international chorus of support for a ceasefire. Uh, the United Nations has been absolutely unequivocal, and there's a, just a growing chorus from around the world. Um, again, unfortunately, not from some of Israel's closest allies. Okay, continuing with the quote. Per morality, if you believe, as you must, in the sanctity of human life and oppose indiscriminate killing, the simple fact of the ever-rising death toll makes the complete cessation of violence a moral imperative. Per common sense, the response to violence with more violence has been the default position of both Hamas and the Israeli state for decades, and the trauma only increases. In his brilliant song poem, Every Grain of Sand, Jewish American Nobel laureate Bob Dylan writes, like Cain, I now behold a chain of events that I must break. We need to make a clean break from the cycle of violence. The horror of the past 10 days now longer has shocked the world. Now is the moment to reject death and violence and embrace humanity's limitless capacity for renewal. I want to say this too. I didn't include the previous line from the Dylan song because in a sense, it's too difficult. But I actually now want to highlight that. And it says... Um, I don't have the inclination to look back on any mistakes. Like Cain, I now behold the chain of events that I must break. And I, I, so I just want to posit that lyric, and it's a difficult lyric, the first half. That's why I didn't include it in the quote. Um, because we are at a point where we don't want to lose sight of our history. There's a lot of contestation on the left about people recognizing history and emphasizing the need to get history right. We at PDA, of course, support that 100%. However, in negotiations at times, sometimes you do have to make a clean break because you're going to have both sides just entrench and argue about the past when you need to have a clear break to go forward. I think something of that order occurred in Northern Ireland and is really at the, at the heart of the diplomatic success that occurred. So yes, we should hold on to history. We absolutely should. We shouldn't do that. But we also, at the same time, have to not get so intensely invested in the arguments about history that we don't move forward with the cessation of violence and the creation of diplomacy. And then we will continue, of course, to hold on to what really happened in history and, and insist that that's not inaccurate, which I don't want to turn away from. But this has become a critique of the left in the United States and the left around the world that in our disempowerment, we become so focused on these debates that we don't focus on the need to move forward and come forward with positive solutions. And this is such an urgent situation. I think we should at least keep a mind open to proceeding in the way that I outlined in the quote. Just a thought, and I'm willing to, of course, share uh, dialogue with everybody who wants to talk to me about this. But there you go. And um, that's my little thoughts at the top of the week. Obviously, a very fraught situation. 
We'll be joined by Jamie McLeod Skinner in a few minutes, but first, Donna Smith with her thoughts for the week, and then Mike Fox with our, no, let's go Mike Fox with the to-dos, then Donna Smith uh, with her thoughts, and then over to Jamie. So, Mike, you're on. Can you hear me, Alan? Yes, I can. Was having some weird mic issues in, in any event. Um, thank everyone for being here today, especially in these trying times, as I say every week, our number one to do on this call is revel in the fact that we're surrounded by people who get it here. In these troubling times, we can all, all very easily lose our hope, lose our faith in a better tomorrow. You're surrounded right now by people who are going to work to make things better. And candidly, I'm sorry I say this all the time, but I have to reinforce it. This is healthcare every Sunday for me. And the mere fact that you all are here makes me healthier. And I thank you for that. So to do number one, take a moment and just Feel the peaceful and potentially productive energy in this room. Number two. Now, less woo-woo. Notes. Take them. Take notes. Because we've got a boatload of very important things we need to get done over the upcoming week. We'll be discussing all of them and doing a real deep dive during family time. So everybody stick around. Jamie's with us. She's going to kill it. She's going to rock it. She's, go she's going to be awesome. And then stick around for family time and we'll really drill down into our to-dos. But briefly, if you have to leave quick, number one, phone banking. I need phone bankers. I need people on the phone. We got them on the call right now. Phone bankers, give me a hand. Toss into the chat why you do it and include the link pdamerica.org slash volunteer. We got a boatload of projects, everything from elections in uh, Virginia coming right around the corner uh, to we got our disabilities call this Wednesday with Congresswoman uh, Debbie Dingell talking about the Disabilities Caucus. We've got solidarity with our union brothers and sisters. We're making calls where there are strike locations, pushing our people out, showing that solidarity. That's going on. And we need folks on the phone. So pdamerica.org slash volunteer, pick an hour one day, and we'll make it happen. Number two, Danette is always tossing into the chat our Congressional Liaison Program. That's where you and a team of folks do outreach to your local congressional office. It's the single best way to have an effect on progressive legislation getting passed. So jump in, uh, jump on that team if you have not yet done so. Uh, likewise, we're going to be tossing into the chat the link to sign on to the ceasefire resolution. We want everybody on this call on that. And uh, lastly, the YouTube link. We have a goal of 100 likes during this presentation. So please stay focused on what Jamie has to say, but make sure that you like and share that YouTube stream, okay? And like, and lastly, fundraising. That's all the, the, the to-do and uh, that's uh, time. And then treasure. We need to bring in uh, funding for Jamie's campaign, for our efforts on her on her behalf, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a minimum goal of two thousand dollars today. Let's if we all come together as a group here and just do ten dollars each, we're well on our way to that goal. If you can do more than that, please do. I'll match the first one hundred dollar donation or better. I'll put the link into the chat here. Let's make some noise. Back to you, Alan. Thank you so much, Mike. And right over to Donna Smith for her thoughts for the week. Donna is, of course, chair of the PDA Advisory Board. Welcome, Donna. Thanks so much, Alan, and thank you, Mike, for always for your. Uh, your enthusiasm that never seems to wane, and we so need it so often right now. Sometimes uh, during the past week, I don't know about the rest of you, but I felt like I'm in some kind of dystopian, weird spot. You know, I, if you listen to the mainstream media, especially, you can feel like you're in some some odd, odd zone. And I think as many of us who can work on that ceasefire and getting ourselves to sign it and others to sign it as possible. It's very, very important to get that done. 
Um, lest you think that uh, the internet hasn't made a lot of difference, think about how different it's been this time around with this conflict with uh, in the Middle East right now and the fear we all have about it escalating and about the United States playing a role in that escalation. Uh, quite honestly, I don't want us to, I want us to stop. But when the internet was not available, the people who were inclined to seek peace weren't so easily connected around the world as we are now. And I think that's something that's very positive and, and has resulted in more of an outcry around the world than we might have heard in the past. There might have been things going around on worldwide, but we might not have heard about them or connected them. Here in Colorado yesterday, there were hundreds of people who gathered on the Capitol steps to call for a ceasefire here. And in a way it was heartbreaking and heartening at the same time to see people bring little children there from you know, all different cultures. That's wonderful and sad at the same time that those little kids know what's, because I know they know. I know I knew when I was out with my parents and we were doing things when I was young. Imagine if you're, you're one of these people sitting over in that part of the world right now, wondering what the heck the future is. And, and we can play a part in that. We really all can if we reach deep enough. If we reach deep enough and into our connections and ask people to sign, to sign whatever comes before us that asks for peace, a ceasefire and peace. We need it so badly in the world everywhere. Um, I also wanted to share, you know, Mike was talking with us about the Congressional Liaison Program. And we talked a few weeks ago about the uh, Climate Emergency Declaration. And Alan contacted me and, and we talked about the fact that Colorado has two senators who are Democrats, but, but those Democrats are hard to pull along on some of our progressive issues. And uh, so I made sure I did my contact with both of them. I haven't heard from Bennett yet, but I did get what I thought was relatively thoughtful response from Hick and Looper. He didn't say he would sign on, but he did say he would look at it. And I think it matters when people reach out, especially if you know your representative or your senator just a little bit. If you know them a bit, you can reach to them and make a difference in what you say to them. I'm not going to be fooled. I don't think Hickenlooper is a big, a big uh, friend of those of us who are calling for a lot of climate change, except, except that things are changing everywhere. I, I'm not going to count anything out right at the moment. Things are changing all over the world. The, the, the energy in the world is changing. And I hope you feel it the way I do. I don't know what direction it's going yet. I don't know. But I feel this, this it's not upheaval. It's something different. It's, it's, it's different. So on Positively Progressive, the podcast we've launched, I hope you've all had a chance to listen to the first episode. If you haven't, please do. Uh, with Tom Hartman, my interview with Tom Hartman, and share it widely if you can. We're still working out some of the details on, on putting it online and making sure it goes everywhere it needs to go. I also just interviewed Nina Turner as my second interview. She was wonderful, recorded the best of the story with a young person. And this is what I want to talk to all of you about. I've decided that one of the things that I can do, because I'm so committed to bringing along the younger generation, lifting them up into positions of uh, political advocacy and action and candidacy where possible. I mean, I can't wait to hear from Jamie. She truly is one of my heroes. I can't wait. If, imagine if we had a Congress just half full of people like Jamie. Imagine that. So I did an interview with a, a, young, uh, a young person, a person in their 20s who's a young professional working as an engineer and talked uh, as a climate engineer, actually, and did a lot of um, listening instead of talking, a lot of listening to what they're thinking about and what's going on with them. And I want to put out to you, if all of you know thoughtful, engaged young people around you in your lives who you think might want to spare just 10 or 10 minutes or so with me, to talk to me and maybe be featured on the podcast to talk about what are your views? What do you hope for? What would you like to do? What are you seeing right now in your, we've got to bring these folks up and do it in a meaningful way, more so than just assigning them tasks at, at events that we go to. They're not just here to make social media work for the rest of us. You know, they're not here to make we old folks feel comfortable on computers 
we're all doing okay with that, Alan, if we've got almost four years of this now. Can you imagine <laughs> four years of this? Oh. Yeah. Anyway, this is a very good thing for all of us, I think. Positively progressive can be a real avenue to have those conversations with those young, young up and coming progressives in our ranks who don't know how to become advocates, who don't know where they fit. You know, years ago, many of you remember, I got, we started our Young Progressive Democrats of America. The problem with it at the time is those people don't always stay young, do they? They age out of college <laughs> and they, you know, they get on with their lives and they move forward. I still have that dream that I think we can have an, a wing of PDA that can be, can be comprised of our young our young progressives who really have some things to, to teach us about what they're thinking and what they believe. Um, one of the things I heard that was most remarkable is that they're not so divided. The younger generation is not so divided as this shit show that's happening at the top in our political environment. They don't have all of these same, all this same baggage that we all have. They don't have it. And they're very clear about what they don't like and what they do like. And I think we can learn from them. So if you've got somebody in your life, send them my way, please. Donna at pdamerica.org. And let's get them online. And Jamie, I can't wait to hear from you. I'm so glad you're running again. I almost want to move to Oregon just to make sure you'll do it. <laughs> all folks. Anyway, thanks, Alan. And back to you. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm going to place right now in the chat, everybody, again, the link to the first episode of um, Donna's podcast, Positively Progressive. It, it is available already on a lot of the popular platforms. We're going to go through and troubleshoot probably between now and next week's town hall to make sure and then we can announce all the, all the platforms that it's on by then. It might be two weeks before we get clarity on all of them, but that is the way to get to it and share it with everybody and uh, make it a habit to listen to and share every installment as it comes out. Couldn't have been happier with the way the first one came out. Um, so Jamie McLeod Skinner is running again for the um, Congress, House of Representatives in the 5th District of Oregon, which is a district that touches parts of the Portland suburbs. And then if I remember correctly from the map, sort of goes south and southeast from there. And um, it is, of course, a district which has a large rural and small town population, has a few population centers other than Portland. And Jamie, of course, pulled a huge victory over Kurt Schrader, a very conservative Democrat in the 2022 primaries, and then barely lost to a uh, Republican nominee in the general by just a few thousand votes. Now, not only is this um, uh, election upcoming, of course, gonna be a presidential race when turnout is always higher, okay? Generally higher turnout across the country historically has favored the Democratic Party more, we shall see. But also, um, let's just say that the Republican Congress right now, not getting very high marks among the American people or anybody who's ever studied politics at all or cared about them. So, um, and of course, it's funny because here I am about to introduce somebody I've got incredible reverence for. And it's amazing, by the way, folks, maybe this will come up in our conversation. Rarely have I had the opportunity in the in-between elections for my esteem for a candidate to grow just exponentially greater. But let me just say, Ben, I had the, I had the honor to do a little work and coordination on some subjects with uh, Jimmy McLeod Skinner. And she is just, an, what Donna said is so true. If we can get people with this kind of just commitment to public service and the welfare of their communities into the U.S. House of Representatives, American society will be doing a heck of a lot better. So, Jamie McLeod Skinner, welcome back to PDA's Town Hall. You are, of course, endorsed by PDA uh, in the race for uh, Oregon's 5th Congressional District. And just uh, open up in the next 10, 10 minutes plus is yours to do with as you like. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all uh, for, for your support last year. Uh, as Alan mentioned, um, you know, we really stood for our values and won a primary by 10 percent. It hadn't what we accomplished last year hadn't happened in 42 years in Oregon. We we you know set a lot of records last year. Uh, in the general, it was a challenge, um, and there were several unique things that happened last year, but we are very well positioned for next year. So your support, your early support means tremendous amount. So thank you for that. Um, and, you know, it's all about being driven by our values. I mean, one of the things that I appreciate so much about PDA is really the focus on values and also really appreciate uh, Alan and, and Mike and Donna, your, your comments, this bringing hope and reflection on how do we pursue our values, especially during challenging times. You know, some of the things that I admire so much about PDA is really this 
this values driven, these shared values of people, planet, our fundamental rights. And, um, you know, and asking Democrats to really live up to those values and our best selves. And so working to bridge the urban rural divide, that's very important to me. I, I'm a rural Democrat. Um, my wife and I live in, in rural central Oregon. And that showing up and listening to voters is really critically important because that's how we understand people's experience, people's issues and craft better policy. So, uh, you know, PDA's Rural New Deal, I'm such a fan of it. I really appreciate all the work that's gone into it. Alan, your leadership, uh, Dave here in, in Oregon, so many Oregonians worked on that and also folks uh, across the country. It's really great, really great legislation, um, or <laughs> potential legislation. It's really great. It's really great policy. Uh, so thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, we actually, we've been, you know, especially in red areas and purple areas, it really starts with showing up and building those relationships, showing up, listening, building those relationships. Actually, in 2018, I ran in the old second congressional district, which inc then included Central Oregon, which is now part of the fifth. And uh, it was considered impossible for a Democrat. I traveled over 45,000 miles in my Jeep and teardrop trailer to just show up and listen and meet people across the most conservative rural parts of Oregon. And you know what I found were just those common values that so many of us really adhere to that you know, I, when I found, regardless of party affiliation, we all want to be able to put a roof over our head and food on our tables. We want opportunities for our kids. We want health care for our families when they're sick. We want we don't want our homes to burn down. We don't want our family farms going under. And those core values, leaning into that together, those are things that Democrats are talking about, but we really have to lean into and, and make that happen. And I think that's critically important. Another really important uh, PDA value for me is it's driven by people. And uh, and I, since when I was first elected to a city council in 2004, I've never taken corporate PAC money. I've always believed very strongly in showing up. I would have monthly town halls at a local coffee shop. Anyone could show up. Equal access was important to me. I, and I wouldn't let people even buy me a cup of coffee because I wanted equal access for someone, whether they were homeless or a CEO. That kind of showing up and being responsive to the needs of your community, I think, is really what we do to get the job done. Um, for those who, who don't know, and, and Alan did a great job of description of Oregon's 5th Congressional District, it's Oregon's only true toss-up district. It's got actually more non-affiliated voters than, than Democrats or Republicans. So this ability to bridge the divide and bring people together is critical, yes, to winning the seat, but even more importantly, I'd argue, to, to having good legislation and serving our communities in ways that we need to. For those who don't know me, just a little bit of background on me. I'm a uh, my background's in engineering and planning. I'm an attorney focused on water law and Indian law, a small business owner. I'm working now on affordable home ownership housing so people can build up equity in their in their families and their own, get, get out of those cycles of generational poverty and also building uh, community resilience, which is so important, especially with so many of the challenges we're facing. I'm very proud of the shoulders that I stand on from my grandparents who were union members who worked in a factory to build tractors to my mom who would get up early to drive a school bus all day teach and the drive a school bus home. And in the summer, she was a farm worker. It's how she as a single mom put food on, on our table. Um, she taught in the Midwest, in East Africa and Southern Oregon and, and here in Central Oregon before she retired. Uh, and my teachers, I'm a, a proud product of Oregon Public Schools. Um, I'm a proud former union member. So all of these values for working people is something that's so near and dear to my heart. And then I actually began my public service over in Bosnia and Kosovo right after that war ended, rebuilding uh, schools and hospitals. Back then, uh, you could not join the military if you were out. I came out as a young adult. And so I worked for a humanitarian organization, the International Rescue Committee. And so from that to uh, reselling refugees and managing cities and leading wildfire recovery, when here in Oregon, a small town was devastated by wildfire, uh, protecting drinking water, developing, as mentioned, affordable housing, and also supporting rural education. These are things I've worked on very closely in the last several years. And then just say, when when I was eight years old, my mom told me to always leave a place better than I found it. And uh, that's really was a driver for me. And so I've really made a career out of solving problems in places where it's tough. And that's the job ahead of us. That's the job for all of us. And that's what I want to do for Oregonians and, and frankly, for Americans in, in Congress. So this seat is critically important. We've got someone who is helping to enforce the, the MAGA agenda and leading bad policy and the complete chaos. Nobody has to argue about wanting to change the chaos we're seeing in Congress right now, but also have a values-driven 
uh, party. So for Democrats to flip the House and make sure that we're focused on people and our planet and our fundamental rights, including the right to abortion health care, which people, Republicans in rural areas want access to as well. Uh, that's codifying those rights is critically, critically important. So, I, you know, and, and the needs of working families is really front and center. You know, housing, I mentioned, child care, education, health care, prescription drugs, food insecurity. Um, these are all issues throughout our state. We actually, with the recent cut to the SNAP program, we've seen food insecurity right here in Central Oregon uh, increase by 20 percent. And, uh, you know, the climate crisis that we're facing, the heat waves, the wildfires we're facing here uh, that we faced in Oregon. So making sure that we are both getting us off this horrific trajectory, but also mitigating the impacts of the climate crisis that we're seeing. And then again, protecting our fundamental rights. Here, there are parts of Central Oregon where they're, they're, uh, Republicans are pushing book banning. And so that's all very real to our experience around us. So making sure that we are able to bridge that divide, have those conversations to change, to essentially win the hearts and minds of people and do that work in rural areas. We know that Democrats tend to do better in urban areas. That's great. We have to keep moving forward and to keep explaining our why in those areas. But it's also in rural areas. So Central Oregon, which we turn from red to purple and making sure that we keep moving forward in that values based, values based uh, policies um, and, and just being fired up by hope. I know I know these are challenging times. I know uh, it's difficult. I know a lot of people are feeling tired, but this is when it's most important. This is when it's most important to really feel fired up. So I always love the enthusiasm and the energy that uh, PDA, that, that you all bring to making sure we're leaning into these core values and, and being proud of, of the, uh, the work we're doing to further our values. So in elections that are coming up right around the corner, uh, in elections for next year, those of us who are building the foundation we need in order to win next year and the investments you're making are so critically important. And it's each and every one of us. And I'll I'll end with this. It's like in here in Oregon, our um, our, our on the off year, or actually this year, we had uh, elections for school district and local elections. And I was out there knocking on doors in purple communities uh, because we have to really build the bench and we build this foundation. We have we talk about our values. We lead with our values, and that's how we win at the local level at the state level and at the federal level. And all of that work, bringing all those folks together and really being proud of these shared values is how we're gonna do it. Uh, we got so close last year. There were several several challenges, unique challenges that we faced last year. Next year is gonna be very different. Um, so we're very well positioned, but can't do it without your help and, and helping us to, to build the building blocks that we need. So thank you so much, but thank you especially for this commitment to moving forward uh, being values driven and being proud of the values that we talk about, because I can tell you from having conversations with folks again across the political spectrum, these values are what bringing us together as Oregonians, as Americans, and it's it's what we need. We need that leadership in Congress to actually get the legislation in, pay, in place to to uh, exercise our values. So thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I am, I've been placing into the chat. And of course, I should have said at the top, but now is the time, folks. Um, maybe I'll just sort of spin my wheels here for about 30 seconds so that you have a chance to hit on that link right there. Secure, Act Blue, Donate, PDA, McLeod, Skinner. And it's set up as a split. Uh, you can set it at whatever level split you like right now. It's a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of the money goes to Jamie's campaign. 50% of the money goes to PDA. Which, by the way, I would encourage people to stick with this because we are going to, as an institution, really invest in this campaign. We're going to try to have infrastructure in place, both to support people, drive people into the campaign, to volunteer for the campaign, and also make calls on our own behalf. And we have a great infrastructure in the state of Oregon, actually, uh, somewhat with, with uh, Jamie's guidance. Uh, PDA got very involved in the election for the chair of the Democratic Party of Oregon. And the candidate that, again, with Jamie's guidance, we endorsed, and I've gotten to know, uh, Rosa Colquitt, is now the chair of the Democratic Party of Oregon. And I got to see her at the recent DNC meeting, and we work with her on a number of different planes, and she is fantastic. And we also have a great infrastructure in the state because we have an affiliated relationship to the people for the reform of the Democratic Party, Larry Taylor's organization, which is based in Oregon. We're separate. We're autonomous. But uh, they are very much involved in the intricacies of the party there. 
And we really want to, again, so we have a lot of really strong activists we're affiliated with. We want to make sure that they're, we're in contact with all of them and that they're doing everything they can to help Jamie win. So again, back into the chat is the donation link. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce to everybody, of course, our Oregon uh, State chapter uh, leader, Dave Alba. And Dave will have a question. But I wanted to ask just this because, and I don't know how much people in Oregon are fully aware of this, but out in the country nationally, the right wing in their sort of like absurd talking points, they're sort of, you know, when I mean, they attack um, uh, what they see as uh, the absurdities of the progressive left, uh, Portland, Oregon is at the very near the top of their talking points. I mean, it's like university campuses, Portland, Oregon. Um, and, um, you know, are you hit with that on the campaign trail? And I can only imagine that you're able to pivot off of that very rapidly with, with everything you just said about bringing things back home. Maybe that's something that, again, you can just speak to as you, are, are those questions brought up on the campaign trail? Does the Republican try to win elections by vilification of Portland? And um, it's important for people out in the country to understand how to negate those kind of talking points. And I think you do it brilliantly. But yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. And I, I didn't know how much it was nationally, but very much right. so. And maybe it's also a carryover from the old Portlandia or whatever. <laughs> see. But yes, and, and it was really interesting is that my opponent last year, what, she literally took a picture of me and superimposed it on one of the, the process that, that had happened in in Portland and tried to very much tie, tie me into um, uh, that narrative of what Portland is. Now, here's a thing I'll say is that for next year, uh, one of the things that we're, we're going to be even stronger on and, and quite frankly tighter on is more rapid responses to some of these some mm -hmm. of these attacks. But um, so one on one, it's quite easy to talk to them once you know people know the situation and the background. It mm -hmm. seems pretty ludicrous because actually my opponent is in the Portland metro area, uh, in the suburbs, and and you know I'm in in rural Central Oregon. But um, but when we're talking to folks, so there's there's two pieces of that. One is that differentiation from, but it's not it's not going arm's length from Portland because the issues that we talked about, housing and healthcare and childcare, those are issues in urban and rural areas across the divide. And so again, by focusing on those issues is really showing folks that we're not getting into political banter, we're focused on solving problems. That's really a first and foremost. The other thing is it's often you know playing up that urban rural divide. So the rural cred and talking about, you know, as a kid, I I uh, mucked horse stalls and bucked hay. I mean, that was part of how I helped my family get by. So that background and that credibility is really important. And uh, actually on top of that, um, there's actually a huge issue in part of the district right now, one of the most rural parts of the district of the corporatization of family farms. So here in Oregon, we've got over 95% of our ag community. Ag community is about 15% of our economy, but over 95% uh, of our ag is small farms. Right now in part of the district, we have uh, corporate chicken farms trying to move in and push mm -hmm. out family farms. And mm -hmm. so that's an area, for example, that when we talk about PDA's value of people versus corporations, that's a huge issue in a very red, very conservative area that Republicans, conservative Republicans are very passionate about because we're seeing our, our ag way of life being changed. And so those are some of the areas that we can really lean into. But in terms of the district itself, talking about issues um, and also talking about them in ways people can hear. We talk about climate change in Portland and the urban areas. We talk about wildfire and drought and flooding and, and talk about the impacts of those uh, of the climate crisis, but not using climate because that's a buzzword. That's how we have those conversations outside of and bring people into, again, focusing on the issues. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, but really understanding the district, talking about issues, and then trying to step back from some of that gamesmanship. But back to the point of contributions and supporting, contributions help us support with our messaging and get our messaging out. And one of the things that we're going to be uh, stronger on next year is more focused and targeted responses to some of that, that messaging and some of those attacks so we can turn them around quicker and not allow them to, to kind of fester in people's minds because that comparison is purposely used to give people a sense that this person is out of touch with your experience. And so our messaging and our ability, you know, the showing up, the meeting people face-to-face, -face, which I love doing, it, but also we can't meet everyone. So having some of those resources to be able to push that message out is really key and central to us being able to, um, 
to get the message out, again, to win the district, but also show the value and the understanding that a lot of Democrats have or can have of experiences of th that rural experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, and on that front, let me introduce everybody. And I believe you're unmuted, Dave, but uh, if not, I'll ask you to unmute again. But Dave Alba is our Oregon State Coordinator, knows, knows Jamie. And I know that uh, he just wanted to chime in with some thoughts and maybe a question for you, Jamie. And, and welcome, Dave. Uh, uh, Ellen, if I can, even as Dave's getting on, I have to give him a huge shout out because as any candidate knows, it's your name and faces out there, but it's really that foundational strength and people out there who don't have their name and face out in front of everyone, but who are actually doing incredible work. And Dave and I have sat down actually in Central Oregon and uh, I shared a beer and talked about things and talked about some of those dynamics. But this guy, I, so I, Alan, sort of stepping in, I want to do the intro for Dave, because this guy <laughs> is one of those folks who's getting it done, not taking credit for anything, but working so hard for our values. So as Oregonians, we are so proud of this guy. So I am so pleased and honored to introduce you all to Dave Alba from, from Oregon. Dave, take it away. Wow. Wow. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Introduced by... Jamie McLeod Skinner. That's a first. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for being here. Hey, um, I think the question that I would ask would have to do with healthcare. You know, as you know, um, the maternity child care family center in Redmond closed in 2019. There have been other hospital closures, not just in rural areas. Now we have one in Eugene closing. And that all within the scope of our passage of uh, Senate Bill 1089, uh, as Oregon moves towards universal health care, we still have this crisis of health care. Um, could you speak to that and uh, especially how that interfaces, um, you know, with what's going on in Oregon and then as a congressional position, how that would interface nationally? Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, no, this is huge. And, you know, and I mentioned before, those core issues that everyone's talking about across the political divide, when your family is sick, you want them to have health care. And you want that to be accessible. And that's both financially accessible and also physically accessible. I mean, there's parts of the state where you literally have to drive for hours to get to a hospital. And so uh, making sure that everyone has has access to so when again when I say access that's also as specifically for rural communities that physical proximity but being able to afford it affordable health care across our state across our country and it's physical and mental or behavioral health care both of those are huge issues right now and um and that's again where we have support across the divide the other thing is is prescription drug costs as well we've seen those really spike and so whether it's someone even folks who you know seniors in in assisted living who have access to health care but don't have access to to affordable prescription drugs uh families you know rural family you get bucked off a horse in, in parts of the state be, and then you getting to a hospital to be able to get get the treatment you need um we saw during COVID a tremendous amount of pressure on uh, on resources. And so it is getting everyone access to a full range of physical mental health care. And so to the point, uh, I usually talk a bit, again about the ideas instead of the buzzwords, but when someone uh, asks about it, I, was, I will say to them, you tell me, you show me a more cost-effective way to provide health care to everyone other than Medicare for all. Tell, make that argument to me, and then let's talk. But what I re, I find really interesting is when I talk to conservatives in rural areas, and they'll say like, "Not that Medicare for all. That's some crazy lefty uh, healthcare." So I'll say, "Okay, well, describe to me what you think would be a good healthcare system," and I tell you, they describe it. So um, so again, that that's such a message to say, I don't care what we call it. Let's talk about the ideas because we've got the majority of support there. Let's talk about the ideas. Let's get people to sign on to those key concepts and then call it what you will, call it what you will. But those key concepts include everyone having access to a full range of physical mental health care, making sure that we have that proximity, but also that it is affordable. And it's the way it's gonna be affordable is providing that baseline of support and having the federal government play a role in that. We know it's gonna drop costs. We see that data proves that to us. And so the challenge right now is to 
for some people, they're on board with it. Let's get it done. For other people, it's bringing them on board with the concept of how we can provide those resources to them. So that's, I think that I jumped in a little bit of the, to the how on that. Uh, but also, you know, again, on, I think it's really important to think about the full range of healthcare. So there's physical healthcare, but there's a lot of folks since COVID and a lot of younger folks who are really struggling right now in some of those behavioral health issues and some of that, the mental health care and needing support in that area. So when we talk about healthcare, I think it's really important that we're looking at that full range. We're also talking about, you know, dental and vision and that, and all those pieces that are sometimes left out, prescription drug prices. Those are things that are often left off the table or people don't include or don't think of as adding to that overall healthcare coverage. And then also how we can provide it in a cost-effective ma manner. Well, we already know that. So let's just go out and do it, but let's finding the way to do it and bringing people on board to it is is part of the challenge I think we're facing right now. Uh, Dave, um, you know, for folks for who don't know, if you actually look at, of course, the Rural New Deal document, you'll notice, and while Anthony and I get all the glory, Dave is a co-author on the Rural New Deal document. So his work has been so incredible. And Dave, do you have any any follow-up or any thoughts, maybe anything you want to say to the group about the Rural New Deal and and um, just how important it is. I mean, it, it you know, let's be let's be honest, folks. The Democratic Party is not doing well in rural America. Okay, and uh, the progressive perspective on issues of rural economics and rural, rural social welfare is very, very strong. And there's a real prospect of you know, we saw Bernie Sanders did very, very well as a candidate. I mean, admittedly, in Democratic primaries across rural America. And Dave, any any thoughts? Maybe you just want to add about the Rural New Deal and Jamie's campaign, the importance of of having a great champion like Jamie uh, really elevate this uh, for Democrats across the country. Uh, can you unmute? Do we have to ask you to unmute? I think that's it. We have to keep asking you to unmute. Sorry about that. Yeah, every time I every time I unmute, then I have to. Um, anyway, yeah. Well, um, I mean, our well, Jamie mentioned, um, you know, like the chicken farms. Uh, we're we're in a good position with. Uh, you know, we're protecting our um, our agriculture from corporate uh, invasion. Um, you know, one, I guess I would think about, you know, one aspect that we have a hard time incorporating into our rural New Deal, and we'll probably, you know, need to, you know, take it further, but how do we include ind indigenous communities in our rural New Deal? And Jamie mentioned some of the work that she's done with Indian law. I guess maybe Jamie, could you just somewhat address our, the situation with indigenous communities and yeah, more we can do, more we can do. Great question, Dave. Here in Oregon, we have nine federally recognized tribes. We also have a tenth, in a sense, in that in uh, Eastern Oregon, there's also overlap with Nez Pierce, um, um, but that the, the central core uh, is not uh, situated in Oregon. So of course, with tribal communities, uh, they're sovereign nations. And so there's really a government to government relationship, but there's also a certain level of trust responsibility that the federal government has. And so the federal government, for example, provides Indian health services. Well, because of the Hyde Amendment, one of the things that uh, tribes do not have access to right now through the Indian health services is uh, abortion health care. And so we've, we've found that um, there are some changes that need to be made in terms of access and providing access to healthcare in general. Uh, and that is something actually also just to, to flag on a national level, you know, something I feel very strongly about, especially after the Dobbs decision, needing to codify access to our fundamental rights like, like abortion healthcare um, uh, in, uh, at the federal level. So that's part of our, our healthcare systems and, and the services provided. But with tribes, it's a combination of making sure we're funding and providing resources and providing services. Uh, but then also with what is needed and what is asked for, that then becomes a, you know, a government to government negotiated discussion. So there's there's kind of a twofold on healthcare. There's what is funded through and, and what is permitted through Congress, um, through the Indian Health Services, um, through the Bureau of, Indi uh, of Indian Affairs, but then also in terms of changes and requests, that then becomes a government to government interaction. Um, and, and having advisors, having folks step up and either make specific requests or have that negotiation, that needs to be part of that 
of that larger conversation. And as I mentioned here in Oregon, there's nine federally recognized tribes. Um, it, there's, you know, each tribal entity has their own distinct needs and identity. There's some commonalities, but of course, as with any government, there's also unique differences. Um, I actually do some work and in, in overlap in, in the role I have, the statewide role in the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board and the, the work we're doing with some tribal communities uh, in support of, of the work they're doing to protect our natural resources. But it is it is different, but somewhat similar to the work on providing health care. Uh, thank you, Dave. And thank you, Jamie. Thank you. And, and I'm going to call on Mike Fox, and then let's get a stack going to ask Jamie some questions from the audience. Mike, you're going to be up next. And I think Mike and I are going to spin our wheels for a second, because one of the things I've learned, I used to be in public radio, is you really have to sort of do a little pitch to raise some money. We're going to do that. So uh, everybody bear with us, but get ready to hit that link and raise some money. Jamie, I'm going to send you a private message in the chat for you. Uh, just a little note here coming through right now for you, I believe. Make sure that went through privately. Yes. And then Mike and I, Mike, go for it. Because let's get everybody clicking on that link and raising some money for Jamie. I know this is all a little bit like people aren't in campaign mode. I understand that, folks. Uh, obviously, the global news has sort of taken the oxygen out of so much of the political discourse around the country. I mean, we have to always be able to diversify in our thinking about things, but it is so essential to have a candidate like Jamie have the resources available, have PDA have the resources available to support Jamie's campaign, and we bring home a victory in the primary, and then we bring home a victory in the general election, and it's going to be absolutely brilliant. I mean, you know, just swinging any one seat, if it was just about that, I mean, we are so close, such a razor's edge about getting the House majority, but this is that plus so, so, so many other things. Having a great progressive champion who's conscious about rural issues is, is practically unique within the U.S. House of Representatives. And as you can tell from listening to uh, Jamie, uh, I mean, her absolute earnestness, her depth of knowledge about issue after issue after issue is exactly what you need. You need it in, in on the congressional, uh, on the floor of the House. You need it on all the panels and subcommittees. And I think Jamie McLeod Skinner is going to be an unbelievably brilliant U.S. Representative. Let's make sure he gets there. Mike Fox, you're up. Thank you, Alan. And I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball here. I'm going to very briefly talk about something that Jamie did that absolutely blew me away that we don't normally focus on in campaigns. When she took that primary, we had weekly campaign calls. She wins the primary, our next week's call. She just hops on, says, oh, I just want to thank everybody who helped me out. We won. And we were talking about a different candidate right then because we were moving forward. She said solidarity with that candidate and then quickly said, I got to go knock doors. Boom, out the door she went. What I say, what I'm pointing to here is she's got great time management skills. That was exactly what had to happen. Show up, say thanks, this gal rocks, show support, down the road to her next call. Brilliant. So with that in mind, slam that donation uh, button and you are going to be supporting a candidate that really has that together, recognizes where she needs to bring people together with, with a touch and heads on down the road to her next call. Thank you for that, Jamie. You rock. Uh, thank you. And again, um, again, spinning our wheels, you're clicking on the link, you're just very quickly uh, adding your information in there, deciding what level you want to support uh, Jamie's campaign, do a split, uh, don't do a split, feel free to donate all your money to Jamie's campaign directly. But, uh, you know, split that 50-50 like it's set up if you like, donate to PDA, donate to Jamie's campaign, certainly PDA will be, uh, I mean, this is absolutely our A double plus race right now. Nothing else has a greater priority of any house race in the country for us. We are so committed to winning this race. And again, just what Mike said, in every way, shape, and form, my understanding, having been uh, you know up on Capitol Hill uh, and knowing the way that offices work and the offices that get things done, all I can say in, in profile and in the depth of knowledge that Jamie will bring to the position, I think we have the makings of a real great uh, congressperson and progressive champion up on Capitol Hill. And we are going to go to the stack now. And... Um, and by the way, Jamie, at any time, if you want to <laughs> add things to uh, a little bit of an effort to uh, pitch, you have no obligation to. We're happy to do all that kind of 
uh, brass tack stuff on this call. But right now, Gloria Berry, you're up and please unmute, Gloria. Thank you so much. And um, first, I want to thank the volunteers that call every week to remind about <laughs> these meetings. Thank you for your persistence. <laughs> um, nice to meet you, Jamie. Um, thank you for all your work and keeping up the good fight. I here in San Francisco am the number one black progressive in the city. I'm elected to our central committee, as well as I'm on the reparations committee. And my question is, what is the holdup on HR 40, uh, the study of reparations on the federal level? And um, do, you, do you support reparations? Yeah, thank you, first of all, for all the work you do. Thanks also for giving a shout out to volunteers and, and folks who are helping to make things happen. We can't do that enough. Uh, I think in terms of the holdup, you know, there's a lot of fear. Well, before the lot of fear, there's there's a lot of racism, there's a lot of challenges that folks are facing, but also a lot of fear of what that might mean. You know, when I when I look at that bill, what I'm seeing is it's an opportunity to do some uh, some reflection on what that reparations might look like. I don't think there's there's any problem, or I don't think an argument can be made for not moving forward on saying what might that look like when we get a fuller picture of of what reparations might look like, that's then an opportunity for people to, to make arguments about what levels might be, what might be appropriate, if people think some things aren't appropriate. But we really have to start out by uh, taking a full look. And frankly, if you look at what South Africa did after apartheid, uh, there was the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. And that effort, I think there's a real opportunity in this country to take that step. Uh, uh, with the Black community, I think with Indigenous communities as well. And um, and I, there's fear around that and there's shame around that. And, um, you know, shame is sometimes, uh, sometimes it's there for a reason. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with us having a national reflection on looking back to say uh, what... Um, what's the horror of our past and how can we acknowledge that so we can move forward as one community? And that's really that legislation. That's what I see in it, that it's an opportunity to have that reflection and also look at what reparations might look like. I think some people just jump to uh, the conclusion of, of what they're afraid of having that conversation or afraid of what that reflection might mean. You know, it, this is important in not just urban areas, but in rural areas. So I was uh, served for four years on a, a rural education service district board in a very diverse county. So very rural, but uh, uh, very diverse. So where it's about a third indigenous, about a third uh, uh, Latino, uh, Latinx, Latin, and about a third Caucasian ag community, um, but, uh, but, but very rural. And a lot of my colleagues on that board were conservatives, Republicans, conservatives. And I actually got my colleagues to pass a racial justice and equity policy in a time when that was exploding around Oregon, that any talk of that was getting all sorts of backlash. Well, I think the opportunity that presented itself was to have a conversation about how can we keep our kids safe? Let's not talk the politics of it. Let's talk about how can we keep our kids safe? How can we make sure the kids are feel safe in their schools and feel supported? When we had the conversation from that angle, we were able to move forward. And I got it passed unanimously with a, with mem members that politically were not interested in going there initially. So that's, I think, the work we have to do. We're talking about reparations. It's an honest reflection of the really horrific history that we have in this country. Again, both for the Black community, for Indigenous communities, for a lot of communities. And having that open discussion like is almost a truth and reconciliation discussion. And then being able to move forward, I think, is a real opportunity. Uh, so I, I think it's a, I think it's a great bill to allow to allow us to have that conversation so we can help with the healing process and help the accountability process as well. Thank you so much uh, for for the great answer and also thank you for the great question. Just for everybody who doesn't know, PDA is of course championing that bill going all the way back to uh, you know back in the day we were very close with John Conyers' office. And uh, thank you, Gloria. And of course, I do have thoughts on on exactly the question. I'm happy to talk with you, Gloria, too, because these are bills that we have pushed, so we actually know the the sort of response of leadership and so on. But it's a uh, it's a tough nut to crack. But I love Jamie's answer because it it really is something that people should embrace. Because if you look at the bill, it's just a common sense step for something that needs to happen. So thank you so much, Beth Angel. You are up next. Please unmute, Beth. 
Hi, Jamie. Good to hear from you again. I hope you make it to the house this time. Um, I've been really concerned with all the radioactive uh, materials coming over from Japan since Fukushima. And my question to you is, one, has it hit the West Coast? Has it hit Oregon? And is there any concern or any talk of that um, in your area or that you've heard about? Thanks. Uh, so protecting our planet and our environment is a huge a huge part of, of discussions we're having. Specific to your question uh, that I have not um i've not heard of of the status i mean i heard of, of the initial um spills and 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 that challenge i don't i don't have a strong sense of where it's at and and uh my district it's it's clearly an issue for oregon as we are a coastal state um it's the the fifth district does not go out to the coast and so i have not you know folks in the district are it's not an an active uh, part of the conversation in the conversation that i'm having but it's you know it is a national issue it is a statewide issue so i look forward to to learning more about it but thanks thanks for that question i also want to say i know that in terms of time we are a bit tight on some time so i'll just flag that i did put at some point my uh email address in the chat and so if folks don't get to it you're welcome to email me uh it's also jamiefororegon.com is our our website and um uh but happy to to answer a question I have, but just if, if folks have questions, I'll get to them when I can, but feel free to shoot an email as well. And do you have five more minutes? Because I think uh, we, yeah, we, we did sure. start a little late. And so we'll go five minutes over the top of the hour. Then we'll go to you, Mike Fox, and then go to family time. But Chuck, you're up. Chuck and Jeffrey, and I suppose we'll close the stack at that. And uh, Oh, man, I stuck it in. Do. All right. Ahead, anyway, um, the Democrats are going around, so my representative, Ted Lou, bragging about the one trillion dollars of the Inflation Reduction Act and how all the good things it did. I think it's totally wrong. I think they should go around talking about the 13 amendments that Bernie tried to get in and couldn't get in because Biden and Bernie went together to get eight trillion. And I think it would be more effective to tell the people, you know, we're not really trying what we can do with this one trillion, but we really wanted eight trillion to really help you. And and so specifically just point out the 13 amendments that Bernie introduced. I think Medicare for all is one of them. But anyway, that's that's what the Democrats really want to do. You got to get rid of the Republicans and the corporate Democrats so we can really help you. And I well, yeah, thanks. Just to say, Chuck, I know that wasn't formally a question, there, but just to say, I think it's really important to to uh, show results. And I, I hear what you're saying about let's th let's dream big. Let's let's look at the, the big picture solutions. But I, I also think it's important to show where those results have come. And then also of that, the infrastructure, um, I'm sorry, Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill, keep in mind that part of that was carved out, especially some of the uh, renewable energy and clean energy solutions were carved out by Republicans um, as part of the compromise bill a few months ago. And that really hit Oregon hard. So we want to talk about and that gets to your point about look what was taken away, those opportunities to address the climate crisis and some of the solutions that Democrats had brought forward. And then uh, those got carved out by Republicans because with the wildfires we're seeing, with the drought we're seeing here in Central Oregon, it's impacting our farmers. Uh, we really want to lean into how we are creating solutions for our families. Um, Jeffrey, uh, please unmute. All right, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. First up, I want to first up, I want to I want to wish you good luck. And secondly, this is for I want to I want to ask you as for advice for those who want to also run for office themselves. How do you how do you get it? How do Paul, how do people like me, us get involved in the community and help help out like you like you were doing? You said you said or, or um something like something like that so that way you can be be seen as a pe people's per people. A, a politician for the people, if you know what I mean. I mean. Great, great question. Uh, so, do you want to serve your community? Um, he's unmuted. You, you're unmuted. You're unmuted. So, I'm guessing from what he said, the answer to that is yes. Or anyone has that. That's the qualification you need. That's the start you need. And then it's it's uh, knowing the folks in your community, thinking about what seat and what office is is a good fit for you in terms of what you're interested in, how you want to serve getting out and meeting people, having those conversations with folks, and really leaning into solutions. I think across the board politically, uh, you know, I could say Oregonians, I think Americans in general are looking for solutions, are looking for folks who want to get stuff done. 
And so it starts with that, that fire in your heart to serve community and make the, make your world, make your community a better place. And that's the qualification you need. So don't be intimidated by anyone who tries to push back and tries to put you down. Sometimes you have to build like what we, we've done over time. We've started out in a very red area and had to build the foundation and move red to purple and, and now per parts of purple to blue. So you have to be willing to do that work and that foundational work. Relationships are key. Really embrace those relationships throughout your community, throughout the area that you serve. It, it is helpful to get a bit of what's called a political resume. So some of the work you do, um, some of the, if there's boards or commissions you can serve on it, cause you also get a sense of how the structure works so that you can also figure out how to engage effectively within the political structure. But it just starts with what's in your heart and um, and then leaning forward into that and, and moving forward and, and wanting to serve your community. That's the criteria. So good luck and, um, and, and let's keep, there's so many ways to serve. You can also work on someone else's campaign to get a sense of how campaigns are structured to, to get a sense of that, that approach. But, um, but just, if you want to serve your community, go out there and do it. You know, um, thank you so much. Great answer. And I actually now maybe want to ask you something. And I, I very much look forward to being in touch with you a lot over the next few months as, as we build up to the primary. By the way, what date is the primary? The primary is essentially in mid-May. Okay. And so, yeah, so we're 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 looking ahead to that. But what's really important, and what was one of the challenges last year in this newly drawn district, right. is um, building up the foundation for the general. So what we're doing is both leading up to the primary, and I'm up over 40 points in the in primary polling. But it's you know we really we still have to lean in and run hard for the primary. But what yeah. we're doing now is also building up the foundation for the general. And because we don't want to wait until after the primary, we, we're doing that work now. And it's also holding Lori's feet to the fire. I mean, who, the person that that ran against last year will, would be, you know, rematch for next year. So these investments now are really looking forward to winning next November. Thank you. And and, uh, and as we go forward, um, just, you know, obviously there's a there's a thing where, you know, the the labels that are used and we we will be always sensitive to whatever guidance you want to provide. You know, if pro saying, you know, progressive Democrat isn't the right way to introduce you, we'll we'll follow your lead on that and and we understand that. But also I wanted to end with this. I, and maybe you can because I've always wondered this. I saw a heat map, which is of course very imprecise, about the um opioid epidemic in the United States of America. And and I don't know what the date was from, but sometime in the last decade. And it was from just at a, a glance at it, Appalachia was the hottest red and something in Southern Oregon was the only part of the country that matched it. And, and to me, the of course, the rural opioid crisis is a signifier for the series of social crises that have inflamed rural and small town America. And clearly, I do think your candidacy and our efforts with the Rural New Deal represent something constitutively different than the mainstream of the Democratic Party and of course, the Republican Party. And uh, just uh, as you close, your thoughts on maybe the opioid epidemic in your district, how that plays out, how much of an issue that is, and the sense maybe are you are people beginning to understand in the district that you do represent a really positive way forward, different than what's been presented by the political classes of both parties so far. Yeah, when you get out and talk to people, people are hurting, especially in rural areas. And now it's it's been traditionally opioid, but it's also the fentanyl crisis now that yeah. we're seeing and adding to it. And some of that is driven by um, by frankly, the despair that people are feeling. So in, in rural areas, building up the economic portfolio, reducing the cost of living, but also uh, providing economic opportunities. And so when we talk about building like a renewable energy grid, those are both, both good paying union jobs and they're also an opportunity to help protect our planet. And they're an opportunity to bring more economic opportunities to rural areas. The um, expanding uh, rural internet and broadband has been really important for expanding economic development. But if you look at, at, at rates, at suicide rates, you see high rates amongst veterans, you see very high rates amongst farmers. And in the farming community is a proud community, very typically rural, typically conservative, typically Republican, but a very proud community who doesn't want to ask for help. And, but also is seeing, through everything from um, you know, the corporatization of agriculture, from the climate crisis, 
all of this is impacting farmers and people are losing people from multi-generational farms. It's a way of life. It's a tradition are losing those opportunities to hand it over to their kids. The levels of depression that, that people are struggling with. You know, I myself, I, I, I graduated high school in Southern Oregon and had to go out of state to actually get a job because there's some place you cannot get a job before coming back home to Oregon. It's these are all challenges people are facing. So whether it is uh, helping to address those challenges, it's it's addressing cost of living issues. It's helping, um, you know, a lot of these problems that we're seeing, we have to look at holistically. And sometimes it's the, the problem itself. So for opioids, making sure that we reduce the explosion and the, the corporatization that was taking advantage of people and, and literally killing people to make a profit. So there was that structure that was in place, but there was also some of the struggle and, and depression that people had from just having things be really difficult. Parts of Oregon are very reminiscent of parts of Appalachian when people think of levels of poverty. Mm. So first you got to show up. Well, and I'll say this too, is a lot of a lot of folks, especially in rural areas, think of Democrats as only caring about the urban areas. Urban areas are very important, but we got to show up. This is, this is what we talk about being values driven. So um, showing up, listening, because Democrats aren't perceived as showing up in rural areas. And frankly, Republicans are not creating solutions. And so there's there's this desperate feeling of being left behind, unheard, unseen. We've got a big join Idaho movement in Oregon okay. in rural areas. Mm-hmm. And it's not so much yeah. that people want to join Idaho, but they want to be heard and they're not feeling listened to. This is a huge opportunity for Democrats, yes, to do better with voters, but more importantly, right. to, to live our values and help people address the challenges that we're facing because people are really hurting. And values-driven policies, showing up for people is is getting the job done. Thank you. You know, you can really feel your love for the communities that you grew up in and that you work inside of. I really appreciate that. I know I said I promised to let you go, but I can't resist introducing you to Paul Stokes, our emeritus uh, New Mexico State Coordinator. I think Paul is maybe thinking like, why don't we have more Jamie McLeod Skinners in New Mexico? Though they do have some great politicians on there. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Jamie, your your recent remarks about what's going on in the in the uh, rural community uh, made me think of uh, of the situation be, uh, regarding uh, um, union the union activities. Uh, I grew up in a rural area, and uh, my observation on that was that that most small, most rural people, including uh, family farms, uh, oppose uh, uh, oppose unions because uh, they just can't afford it. Uh, I don't know what the situation is today, but, but, but I think uh, small family farms in particular really can't afford what is normally considered as a union wage, and they don't pay it. For people that work for them, in fact, the family farms a lot of times uh, are the the uh, labor force is the ownership of the family farm, and uh, and and but they do have to add people. They do they do need to hire people to help out with their farm operation, and uh, unionism I think is just a visceral response, a negative response from them. So. Uh, so the, that concerns me because it divides us in the progressive community. Uh, uh, I mean, we're we're strongly for union activity and union wage, and uh, and we ought to be. But how how do we deal with this concern? And how do we? Uh, is there a way to capture some of the rural areas that we don't now because they do have this visceral response? Well, I can tell you conversations uh, in, well, this is up in the, the Columbia Gorge area. I remember having a, a touring a, a cherry farm and, and having a conversation with cherry farm, uh, the cherry farm owners. So it's a family farm, uh, but they have a product and they export it. It's a very time sensitive product. Um, but they, uh, the, the owner of that farm was talking about all the steps he's taken to um, make sure that uh, he has strong relationships with his workers. And, and in, in his case, it was uh, uh, migrant farm workers who would actually do some work in, in California and then come up through Oregon and then also in Washington um, based on the, on the season and, and, the, and the crops. 
Uh, but what he, the steps he had taken was to make sure that he took the, that bigger picture. So their salaries and, and he was leaning into to providing, you know, living wage salaries, but he was also looking at things like providing housing, providing other resources. So when you're looking at that big picture, there is overall what people, the resource people are getting, but, but then also the cost of living. And that's in a lot of the conversation I'm having with folks now, it's those cost of living pieces that are really hurting. Um, so, you know, ultimately it comes down to income versus outgo in terms of where we're at. So having, having good paying jobs and union wage jobs is, is critically important for uh, making sure that that the benefits and the salary are high enough. But one of the ways that he, and I don't believe he had a union workforce, um, but what he was doing was essentially trying to accomplish that end goal by supplementing the needs of his workforce so that they could have a, a positive differential based on the income they got and also uh, their actual cost of living and housing is just is a huge cost of living. So he was providing supplementing in that way. You know, I think I think in, for unions in general, I think the the important thing to really lean into is yes, there's salary and there's wages, there's benefits, but also safety and protections. And and there's some workforces that um, are eagerly seeking uh, union, you know, being able to unionize. And I think everyone should have that right. Uh, and there's some it, the folks are often drawn to that if they're facing incredible hardship. And so the, the union becomes that that muscle to be able to make sure that people are protected. And so I think the way that some farmers that, that at least that I talked to in some uh, areas that I've toured have tried to address that bigger picture with some of the, the resources they've provided. But it, it is it is part of that controversy. It is part of that tension we, we face. Um, but then also some of the challenges with farmers that I'm talking to, especially in, in nurseries and, and, and smaller farmers in the Willamette Valley, is they've talked about how some of they can't control their their or their their price points. And so the right. price points are controlled by the market. And so they've just got to eat whatever costs they they bear in order to be able to to sell at a, a fixed cost point. You know, they, <laughs> that that's a problem. That's a problem. So it, it's it it puts the uh, farmer in that crunch point where if even if they're trying to do the right thing and provide the resources necessary for their workforce, then they they end up operating at a loss. So we've got to look at some of those structural things as well to make sure that that farmers can, you know, pay fair wages and provide for their workforce because there is a real commitment and a real appreciation that I hear time and time again from farmers for their workforce and at the same time allow them to make a profit so they can put food on their table as well. And Paul, um, um, I, I asked you to unmute again if you wanted to follow up. We, we should wrap, but um, you know, one of the things in the rural New Deal we do have uh, very quickly um, the point made that uh, you know if something is um, clearly a family-owned farm, a small business farm, that supplementary income for um, workers to bring them up to a living wage is something that we would we are proposing in the rural New Deal. And I, you know, I'm not a historian of of, of U.S. agricultural history, um, but uh, in only in a very vague, broad stroke way, am I aware that obviously the federal government with the Roosevelt administration made a major intervention to keep family, to keep farms afloat through um, supplementing payments around buying grain. I mean, I think everybody sort of has that vague sense that that exists in the United States. And while clearly there is also along the lines of what you outlined, Paul, and what, a lot of what Jamie has said about, you know, um, uh, sell, you know being resilient, being uh, uh, not receiving help from outside and the resistance to it sort of culturally, it really is part of the fabric of American agricultural life that there are these federal supplements. And if in the rural New Deal, what one of the things we're proposing is, okay, here are a set of them. They're all organized to have input from people at the local level, at the just individual business level. But at the same time, it is a template from the federal government with the federal government as the financial backstop to provide these supports so that we can have more prosperity across rural and small town America. So that's in there. And um, Jimmy, Jamie, if I want to respond to that and then Paul, a final thought. Yeah, no, no, that's 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 right on. Something I really appreciate about the, the Rural New Deal that was put together. Uh, two other things. And one, someone noted actually in, in the chat about uh, marketing cooperatives that, that that help farmers. So there there are structures that that provide some level of equivalency on that that's really helpful. Uh, but the other thing, too, is looking at our regulation. This is actually an issue that I heard from a farmer here in Oregon where our Department of Environmental Quality 
has waivers for for um, corporate farms or larger farms in certain areas on certain protections, but those protections are required of small farmers, which is insane. So you have these, it, you, you have a larger farm that would be having a, a greater impact get, gets the requirements waived and also has the resources to cover it, has, has those requirements waived, but small family farmers can, cannot get those, um, they, they essentially have a different a different criteria that they have to meet. So it's almost, it feels like it's almost designed to make it tough for for full, small family farms, for the little guy. So even looking at some of those things, you know, at the state level, I'm sure a lot of states have some of this, but also at the federal level. Um, but but I think this in Oregon, I think we're gonna see this more and more and, and it's more of a state level issue in terms of regulation, but I'm, I'm really hoping that people don't, politically don't go into their respective corners and I'm seeing this from some Republicans. It's like, no, all get out of the way of farmers, period, not realizing that they're creating a competitive advantage for corporate farms and hurting small family farms. That was a big issue. And Dave spoke to this. He, I know he did some work on this last year. Uh, and there was some legislation went through that put a pause on something that was going to go forward. Uh, but we, it, it's just really important to see these things because some of our core values, including our small family farmers who are you know, part of local co-ops and, and part of the local school boards and, and city councils and really investing in keeping those resources in a community are, are now starting to be driven out. And and I know this has happened to some East Coast states, but it's we're starting to see it happen now in Oregon. It's really frightening in terms of the trajectory. Paul, final thought? <clears throat> um, well, I really appreciate your responses and your thoughtful uh ideas about about how to how to deal with this but the, but the problem is still there and and uh so i'm glad you're dealing with it but i i think the rest of us have to too right uh, and uh so so your advice is important your experience is important <clears throat> well thanks for your work paul and work for all of us to be done and and ellen what i really appreciate too you named it but i think this is true for all of us this i was talking about being values driven but it really comes from the heart we love our communities uh and, and it's and that love is why we do this work we need to win elections so we that we can get these policies put into place at local state and fed in the federal level uh, and that's where we're working together so thank you all you all took time today to be here to have this conversation this is a values-driven conversation about our communities, about making our communities a better place, our country a better place. And I'm, I'm just really, I'm so proud again. Thank you so much for your endorsement. I'm proud of the work you guys do. I'm proud of this, this absolute commitment to being our better selves. And even as a Democrat and challenging Democrats, that's right. not something for Democrats to be scared of. That's something to be, to be proud of and lean into. We're challenging ourselves to be our better selves. And that's what you guys are doing. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you so much, Jamie McLeod Skinner. Big standing ovation. Well, I'm standing here. I'm standing. Standing ovation. And uh, let's let's get to work and uh, let's uh, donate to the campaign and let's get to work and be prepared to work hard to make sure Jamie wins the primary in May and then wins the general election. And then I'll see you up on Capitol Hill in January 2025. But I'll see you in Oregon before then, I'm sure. And take care. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. And Mr. Mike Fox, we are we are late on our PDA to dos, but the first I know is to raise money. So why don't you give a little push for that? And uh, let's do that before we go to family time. And at least that aspect of the to dos, let's do that right now. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's just cover money. We'll wrap this thing, and everybody stick around for family time. And YouTube folks. If you want to be a part of the discussion with the cool kids, make sure that you sign up for our Zoom right there on the stream. Once it's wrapped, Matt will make sure that the sign up link is there. Get on the Zoom. Because while it was great having Jamie here on this YouTube stream, uh, bottom line, you want to be a part of that discussion in family time. So, very quickly, my favorite thing in the week thank yous. The following people have donated. Thank you so much, Jim and Dorothy. As always, thank you for your more than kind $100. And Margaret and phone banker Bo, Patricia, Carlos, phone banker Michael, phone banker Rick, phone banker Carl. Listen to those double dippers. And Russell up in Massachusetts and phone banker Aaron and Astrid, Larry, phone banker Patricia, phone banker Andrew, Mary, Bob, uh, Laura, Neil, Robin, Charles, Michael Moore, um, 
Don't know that that's the Michael Moore, but good on you, Michael Moore. Uh, uh, Rick again. Christine, phone banker Rick again. Uh, phone banker Dr. Deutsch. Matthew and Michael and phone banker Betsy. Lori. Maxine. Randy. Nina. John, phone banker Jane, phone banker Erica, phone banker Aaron, and Michael. Thank you all for your more than kind donations. And we still got a ways to go, gang. Something that I would mention here. It was wonderful having Jamie with us for an hour. That was a lovely thing. We got to recognize, gang, that the only way that she can take time like that with folks like us, is if her fundraising is going. There will be a time when her campaign manager, rightfully so, comes to her and says, dude, I need you on a phone for that hour instead of talking to those PDA people or you name it, because she's got to hit certain goals. So I would simply ask right now, we're behind on goal. Bam, into the chat it goes. Hit that donation link. And if you just throw in five bucks, just five bucks, be a beautiful thing. And we will get much closer to our goal for this call. Now, as far as the other to-dos are concerned, stick with us during family time. And we're going to have a robust conversation about what else it is we can get done. Back to you, Alan, to wrap it up. Thank you so much. And yeah, I hope everybody can see that. Um... Uh, just from this call, and um, obviously the incredible, first of all, the, the, the clarity of the message on what can be very complex issues, but the passion for uh, the community that Jamie is seeking to represent, the welfare of the people there, and then the welfare of the country, and, and even the world, if you extend out the sort of ethics and morals of, of, of what Jamie is presenting and how she is committed to uh, these things and really understanding the details of them fully in order to uh, create the best possible public policy, which is what you're tasked to do when you are uh, up uh, on Capitol Hill uh, representing the people of your district as their uh, congressperson. So very, very important race for PDA, for the country, uh, for the Democratic Party. And uh, we really are going to uh, prioritize this uh, as much as any race in the country. And uh, we are anticipating a great result. So. Um, you know, just thank you so much for Jamie McLeod Skinner. Thank you so much for Dave Alba helping set the show up, of course. Uh, Mike and the whole PDA staff. Alex, you'll be top of the uh, stack at family time. And um, next week, uh, we are, uh, I will be reaching out to Jim, Jim Zogby, who is a great um, Arab American uh, activist, longtime ally of PDA. Um, uh, yes, the famous pollster now retired from that work. Um, and, uh, you know, progressive Democratic Party activist. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Jim and I were talking about having him on around this time of the year, a few weeks ago, uh, concerning um, the issue of visa waivers and Israel and Palestine and the United States and how the contradiction there is, is quite glaring. That's a subject I won't go into right now. Uh, so just about that subject, but of course, uh, Jim has been outspoken with a, with a beautiful um, progressive humanitarian response to the conflagration Israel-Palestine. Last week's show, by the way, we we had intended to structure it where we would have had a uh, Palestinian-American or Palestinian guest on as well, but the sort of organization of that show ended up quite complex because people's schedules were so difficult. So um, I am hoping that Jim can join us next Sunday. He has a difficult schedule. The following week will be Nina Turner, and we're going to go from there with just incredible town halls going forward now. Um, very difficult phase of history we're in right now. And of course, PDA is active on all fronts to address all issues, as we always do. So thank you to everybody. We'll see you next week at the PDA Town Hall. And again, thanks to great congressional candidate in Oregon's fifth, Jamie McLeod Skinner, PDA endorsed.